In this open fringe tutorial, I would like to talk a little bit about Zernike polynomials and the Zernike dialog. Zernike polynomials are useful for representing errors on circular disks like the surface of telescope mirrors. Open fringe uses Zernike polynomials in just that way, so it's helpful to learn a little bit about how open fringe uses them and uh, how you can uh, play with them and learn a little bit more about them. When you first open Open Fringe, it displays a surface that has been made from a default set of Zernike polynomials that I picked just to make an interesting display. In fact, I've been thinking about for each version of Open Fringe, I might create a little different a set of polynomials so that uh, the picture will be different, kind of like a version number. This particular surface is a, made by a combination of the spherical null that was turned on in the mirror test parameters dialog box. So I'm going to turn that off right now. And the surface is going to change. And then the other part that was controlling the surface is over here in the Zernike terms dialog, which allows you to change Zernike polynomial co coefficients. In this particular case, the only uh, Zernike polynomial coefficient that has been turned on is the spherical term, and I'm going, now going to turn and, and uh, change that to zero. You do that by clicking on the value over here on the right-hand side, then it'll bring up a little edit box, as you can see here, and I will type a zero in give that term a zero coefficient. Now the surface has no error whatsoever. I wanted to turn off all the Zernike coefficients because it's easier to see what any one term does when only that one term is turned on. Okay, let's uh, take a look at what this uh, Zernike terms dialog box has on it. First, it has each one a row for each of the Zernike terms that it uses, and there's uses up to this many terms, as you can see here on the dialog box. Whether the terms are turned on or not is governed by a little checkbox over here under the term side. You see, I have x a stig, y a stig, and quite a few. Uh, from spherical onward turned on, and that's typically what we have turned on when we analyze telescope mirrors. Over here on the right-hand side, we have the value of those particular Zernike ter term coefficients. The first four Zernike terms of piston, x-tilt, y-tilt, and defocus are functions of how the interferometer is set up and not of how the mirror is, not any air on the mirror itself. So we turn those uh, items off. You actually don't have to have a real good understanding of Zernike terms and Zernike coefficients to understand how to use open fringe or to analyze telescope mirrors. But if you're the kind of person who likes to know a little bit about how stuff under the covers works, this tutorial is here to help you understand them and how you can use Open Fringe itself to help you learn more about them. Okay, well let's play with a few of the Zernike terms to see what they do. And even though we normally turn X tilt off, let's turn that one on now and see what happens. The surface is highly tilted now. In fact, the value of 30 is usually pretty big. So let's change that by clicking on the value itself and then type in maybe uh, a 1. So now you can see what the x-tilt represents on the surface of the mirror. This is the x-direction and you can see the surface has been tilted up as x increases over here to the right. Normally, we don't put any values in the Zernike terms dialog box ourselves. Open Fringe fills it out from analyzing the mirror. But 
I allow people to change these values to play with it and uh, to learn more about Cerniki polynomials. Another use for inputting our own Zerniki term values, coefficient values, is when we are making our own uh, interferograms to play with and learn how to use open fringe. Also, it's useful for seeing what errors show up in the simulated Foucault and uh, Foucault uh, simulations, star test, and Ronke uh, simulations. So let's take a look at one of those simulations. In particular, let's take a look at the uh, simulated igram. So now it turns out that anytime we change, once we've turned on the simulated igram and we change a, a Zernike term, it immediately shows up in the simulated igram. So let's add a bit more tilt to this. Let's give it a tilt of 10 and see what happens. We get, of course, more lines as the tilt uh, gets larger. We can add some y tilt. Y tilt will sum with the x tilt and give us kind of a diagonal tilt as we go off over here. This type of number of fringes that we'd have would be good for using our FFT analysis on this kind of interferogram. Okay, let's continue on by adding in a little bit of defocus. A positive number means we're further away from the radius of curvature of the mirror. You can see then that it adds a bit of curve to the to the fringes. Since earlier I had turned off the artificial null, we this is the same as testing a sphere. Then lastly, let's go in and uh, add a little bit of spherical term to this mirror, it's a little bit of spherical air, and I'm going to make a minus 0.5 as the air value. And that hardly made any change to the mirror at all. Let me change it to maybe a minus 2.5. Six. There we go. Now you're seeing a little bit of what how the spherical term affects the uh, interferogram. Next, let's go back to the surface display. And right now, because we have so much Y tilt, it's going to be pretty uh, tilted up, and we're not going to see so much. So I'm going to turn off that Y tilt, so you can see what we did. When, and I'm going to turn off the x-tilt, and I'm going to turn off the defocus. And there now, that is our um, how much our mirror differs from a real sphere. Quite a bit of, uh, of an air on it if we had wanted a sphere, but perhaps we had wanted a uh, paraboloid, and you might uh, we'll turn on the artificial null, and then it will say how well, how much this differs from a real paraboloid, and that's because it, ha it differs quite a bit because we have quite a bit of spherical aberration in it. Let's make it actually match the spherical term of the spherical null. That's how much spherical aberration it's supposed to have in it, minus 1.759. So let's add that back into our dialog, change it to minus 1.759. And we have an almost air-free surface. Let me add the defocus back in. That's our interferometer has been pulled out back away from the focus. I'm going to add the tilt back in. The y tilt, the x tilt. And then I'm going back to the simulation igram, turn it back on again, and see how it has changed. So this should be an interferogram of an almost 
perfect uh, paraboloid of the parameters that we had set in our mirror dialog and one of the things we could do with this now is take it over into the analysis section of the program and see what kind of surface we can generate or analyze from this interferogram. But I'm going to leave that as an exercise for the student. And instead, since this is a tutorial about Zernike terms, I'm going to start turning off some of these we've been playing with and turn on some other terms. So we turn off the x-tilt, turn off the y-tilt, we're going to turn off the defocus. It's interesting to watch how the interferogram changes as we do some of these things. Uh, let's try a little bit of exastig. Let's put in about 0.1 of exastig and see what happens to the interferogram. You can see it kind of flattens it out there. Let's try a value of 1. There we go, flattened it out even more. Let's go over and take a look at what it did to the surface. There it is, exastig in all its glory. If we want to turn that off, which I will here. And now let's turn on Yastig. This might be a little surprise to you. Yastig, you might think, if Xastig was horizontal direction, you might think Yastig is in a vertical direction, but it's not. Put in a value of 0.5. It's actually a value that is diagonal. That's because Xastig can also be in the vertical range. All we have to do is change the sign of it. So minus 1 into the exastig and watch it flip. The vertical direction goes high instead of the horizontal direction. Well, let's take a look at uh, trefoil. That's a three-fold symmetry problem. I'll do a minus 0.5 and there's what trefoil looks like and it has an X term and it has a Y term. Secondary astig, I don't exactly remember what it looks like. Let's take a look. So that's secondary astig. And lastly, let's take a look at seventh spherical. It has uh, quite a few little bumps in it. Make a very zony mirror with it. So now we have a bit of second a, a stick, secondary a stick, and seventh spherical in our mirror. And um, so these are all the kinds of things you can do and play around with the Zerniki dialog box. Okay, I have to hurry up a little bit so I can get all this done into the 15 minute limit that Yahoo uh, YouTube provides. So let's go over to the Ronki simulation. Change it to about uh, 0.2 offset. Maybe a point five offset. And you can see then what the, some of these terms are doing to a Ronke image. So let's take the uh, spherical, seventh spherical out of it. And then we will take the other term out of it. Uh, I've forgotten what other one I had turned on. There it is. Second, secondary astig. It probably won't affect it much. And we could add, say, third spherical. I've added a lot. So you can play with that and uh, have fun with the Zerniki dialog box.